If you've been following along with our Wood Turning 101 project videos, up till now we've done all of the standard projects that we do in a five day Wood Turning 101 course. Some classes have a little bit of time at the end and we throw in a bonus project. Our bonus project is our thin stem goblet. With this project we'll do We'll rough this out with the spindle roughing gouge. We'll hollow end grain away from the chuck. Talk about scraping the inside of the, the goblet. We'll talk about proper scraping techniques on the inside of the goblet. And then of course turning the thin stem. We'll also talk about proper grain orientation and wood selection for this project. So with that, let's get started on this project. We can do this out of many different woods, but one of the things I like to do is look at the grain and I want a nice straight grain piece like I've got on this piece of walnut here, unlike this curly piece of maple. Where I've got the curl on the maple, the nice fiddle back, that can be problematic as I get into my stem and I get small in diameter because those grains are literally zigzagging through the blank and I get very thin on that that can shear off where the grain is running biased to the axis of the lathe. So we're going to go with this walnut blank. I've got a two and a half by two and a half by seven inch piece of wood here. I'm also looking at my end grain and I've got some nice straight growth rings going through here. I've got some lighter colored wood on the outside of this. This was sap wood here. This was out of a very large walnut tree and it's the outside cut. So those growth rings are going as straight as possible as they can through this blank. The only thing that would be better is it would be if this blank had been quarter sawn. But let's go ahead and lay this out. So we'll mark our, take our center finder. and mark our centers. I can now set up my lathe to mount this blank between centers. I've got my centers that I've selected here. I've got a stub center or a multi-tooth cut center. That'll go into my drive end. And then I've got my cup center with a revolving, with bearings in it on my revolving center. Bring my banjo over. Now we talked about this earlier. My cup centers, or my multi-two centers have got, they're spring-loaded, so I can place that center point into, onto that point, then bring my tailstock up, and that'll spin freely until I am ready to tighten that up. I'm gonna grab my tool rest, Start setting up my banjo. Standard tool rest height, which again, my tool held level on the rest. The cutting edge is at standard or is, is at center. And we're starting with my spindle roughing gouge. Now that we've got our tool rest height set, let's look at setting our tool rest to make sure it's parallel to the work. So I can look straight down on my piece and set the gap here so that I'm parallel. And now I can secure and lock my banjo 
and my tool rest in place. My piece still spins freely and I've got about three-eighths of an inch gap between my rest and my piece. I'm not tight yet on my tailstock, so I'll go ahead and bring that tension up and take the vibration out of the quill. So as we do the math on this, two and a half inches in diameter times the speed of the lathe. My max speed of the lathe is 3200 RPM. So if I take and I times 2.5 times 3200, I'm getting around 8,000. That puts me in a good place safety-wise that I want to be, uh, with that formula being the diameter times the RPM should equal between 6 and 9,000. So I'm below the maximum RPM that this piece should be able to turn safely, yet I'm above the minimum RPM for cutting efficiently. So at max RPM, I'll hear the motor revving a little bit on this, but it's still safe. Now that I've got my machine set up, and before I start it, I want to put on my safety equipment. For the purposes of the video, I'm not wearing my normal face shield. I normally wear a powered respirator and face shield combination, and that protects both my face and my lungs, even though this face doesn't need a lot of protection. My eyes do, you're only given one pair. I'm gonna wear my safety glasses. However, I am very secure between centers here. This is one of the safest ways to hold the work, and I wanna make sure that I'm in good and safe. As far as the dust goes, we do have a dust collector running in the room to try and draw dust away from me so I'm not having to, to deal with all of the dust from a piece. I will have some that we'll have to deal with that I, where I don't have my power dress braider on. Now a couple of notes, as I bring this up to speed, I'm gonna start at zero. I have an electronic variable speed so I can start at zero on this machine and then slowly bring it up to speed. While I do that, I'm going to stand a little bit to the side. That way I'm out of the line of fire. If this piece has a hidden crack in it that I was unable to see as I worked and laid out my centers and processed the blank this far, or something that it happens to blow apart, I'm not in the line of fire. I'm very secure between centers here. As I bring my speed up, start my, my lathe, it's at zero, I'm going to slowly bring my speed up and I'm going to keep my other hand on the tailstock of the machine feeling for vibration. A piece this size, I shouldn't have a lot of vibration with a machine this large and heavy. This should be quite secure. There's about 2,500 RPM. I can feel some air movement from the square corners on here. This is a good place. I feel comfortable in starting. I'm not oversped by any means, but I'm kind of turning fast enough to cut efficient. As I start to cut this and set up my cut, my feet are about shoulder width apart, parallel to the axis of the lathe. My right foot's maybe slightly back just a little bit, and that lets me twist my body. I've got my left hand on the rest, sliding back and forth across. I've got the tool on top of the rest. Try to avoid putting your finger between the tool and the tool rest. That's not a good thing. If you do that, you'll figure out why I recommended that you don't very soon. Hand underneath the tool, handle down. My handle is clear down at my side here and I've got the tool pointed in the direction I want to cut. Again, we're cutting spindle work. My grain is running parallel to the axis of the lathe, so I'm going to cut large diameter to small diameter here. Anchor to the rest, find the bevel by picking up the handle, and then cut as a, that's my basic ABCs. If you want to add D, direction, or design. And I'm just going to come in and take steps out of this blank first. I'm not going to 
push these all the way to the end. There's no need for that right now. I'm taking steps out of it. As I get down towards the end here, I need to have some place to start my cut, so I turn the tool over slightly, shift my weight, my feet didn't move, and then I can just come in and cut the other direction. Always large diameter to small. You can still hear a flat spot in the blank. I'm now getting a pretty good gap between my tool rest and my blank, so I've shut the lathe off and I'm going to bring that tool rest in. I'm back to that quarter to three-eighths of an inch gap on there. I've still got a little flat spot on the blank on two sides. Come in and make a slow down my cut. And by slow down my cut, it's the speed I'm traveling sideways, and that'll give me a better finish. A nice bevel riding cut. The tip is about a 45 degree angle from the cutting circle, and that gives me a nice shear on the tool. And I'm getting a nice shaving off of the tool. Still got a little flat in there. I'm going to leave that for now. And as I turn it around and go to true the piece up, then I'll get underneath that flat area. I'm going to cut my tenon in now. The first tool to come to hand is my skew. I'm going to lay it flat on the rest. Start with the handle up level. Get under that first little layer and then drop the handle and arc the cut in. I want about a two to a two and an eighth inch diameter tenon for the chuck jaws that I'm using. I want to make certain that I don't have any debris or rough edges down in here. I've got a good dovetail of about seven degrees and then I've got as I put my straight edge on the piece I've got a slight gap in the center of the rule between the rule and the wood right there and it, the ruler doesn't rock, it registers on there. If you've got a crown on that tenon, recut it and make sure that you've got that flat so those, the shoulders of that chuck jaw rest on this piece. If you have serrated jaws on your chuck, you cut a square shoulder rather than a dovetail tenon for that. If you've got a question on what kind of tenon you're, you should be cutting, go back and look at your owner's manual. They all explain what kind of tenon those jaws should have. Some manufacturers are quite specific on how their tenons should be shaped. If you've got a question beyond that, can't find your owner's manual online or in your print version of it, give our technicians a call at our 800 number. Our next step is going to be place this piece in the chuck. So I slide my tailstock out of the way, bring my banjo back, grab my knockout bar, place your hands to the side of the, your center, not over the top, give that a little tap, You do want to catch those drive centers rather than throw them on the floor and bang the tips up. As I put my chuck on, I always brush the shoulder here and I make sure that the shoulder here 
doesn't have a bunch of crud build up on it. I hold the chuck and then turn the hand wheel. The last little bit, eighth of a turn or so, I give that a little flick just to lock that in secure. Again, make certain that I don't have any debris that's got into this tenon and my chuck jaws are free of debris. And I'm going to hold the piece in against the shoulders and tighten this up. I tend to do it three times with the same tension. Even though each of the chuck keys or scroll gears are self-centering and all four jaws move at one time, I put the same amount of tension on each chuck key as I go around and I pick up a little bit of mechanical slack each time I tighten that and I just find a point to where I'm no longer picking up the mechanical slack. For me that's about three times or one and a half turns of the, the chuck. I can bring my tailstock back up in. My center should line up with the existing center mark and then I can bring my banjo in. One consideration I need to take into account here is this is a 14 inch rest, the standard Powermatic rest. This rest is not going to allow me to come in and get a small gap and be parallel to the work because I'm hitting my chuck here. I'm not a big fan of having that rest in a position like this if I don't need it. Um, especially on spindle work here. So I'll be changing my tool rest over and I'll go to a shorter rest. So I've got an 8 inch rest here. And I'm going to set it up standard tool rest height and parallel. And with this shorter rest, I can come in parallel rather than being askew as I was with the longer rest. Now right there you may have seen me just move the chuck just a little bit with my hand. What I did was I lined up my chuck jaws to where the gap is vertical. That gives me the center height here. To, to glance against as I'm setting, or to glance over to as I'm setting up my standard tool rest height. And so it gives me a nice little visual indicator as to where that is. Helpful little tip that I found along the way. Turn your piece by hand. I've got a little bit of a flat in one spot. Everything's running clear. Because I've remounted the piece, I'm going to turn my speed down to zero and I'll bring it back up. I don't take for granted that because I've turned this piece around, it's going to run at the same RPM that it ran beforehand. Things may have moved and weight differences, so I always go back to a zero point and then bring my speed up. Standing again to the side, out of the line of fire and one hand on the machine feeling for vibration and the other one bringing the speed up. Anchor, bevel, and I can hear just a little bounce. And then bring my cut across. I just touched the jaws with the back of my gouge, no harm. That just lets me get as much of this surface cut nice and evenly as possible. I'm just going to come back and lightly bump the back of my tool against my chuck jaws to get as tight as I can.
and take a nice skimming cut. And then look at this surface and make sure that I don't have any flats left on it, any torn grain, everything's cut clean, that looks nice. My next step is going to be to come in and face this surface off here. So I'm going to move my tool rest and I will tuck it in a little bit. I'm going to pick up my 3 8 spindle gouge. Set my tool rest for standard tool rest height and I tuck that in, like I mentioned, that's going to get me a little closer as I come across. If I lift it parallel to the axis, I'd be hanging out with quite a bit more still over the tool rest than I am going to be here. I'm going to start with my handle up, my flute closed, my bevel pointed in the direction I want to cut. Once I get a place for my shoulder to ride, I'm going to drop the handle and the tool, tip of the tool arcs towards center. I'm going to stop, look at that surface, make sure it's cut nice and clean. So I'm Cut clean there, I'm cut clean here. I can start to shape the bowl on this goblet. I'm going to come down, I'm just putting a random mark in here I'm just as a guideline to where I'm going to start to shape. I wouldn't come in with a parting tool at this point and neck this down because I want to leave the strength up here for hollowing this. But I'm going to start by shaping, rough shaping. I'm going to start by rough shaping the bowl here. And the simplest shape is going to be just a simple open bowl shape, a nice little curve coming in here. I'm only going down to about one and three quarters to two inches in diameter here. I'm leaving a lot of mass in this piece still. I've got to come in and hollow this out and I don't want to get thin back here. So leave a lot of mass in here. You notice how that length line keeps sliding up from where I originally drew that pencil line. I keep sliding up as that curve comes in. Just a simple shape on this goblet. And now we'll move our tailstock out of the way. I don't need to bump into that revolving center and put the mark of a wood turner in my elbow. So I'll take it out. I want to set my tool rest at standard tool rest height or just about a sixteenth of an inch below right now. First thing I'm going to do is continue to face off this blank. Anchor, bevel, cut. Without the tailstock, you can immediately start to hear some vibration here. Now as I come around and I go to start hollowing this, I want to get as much room as I possibly can 
So I'm going to slide that, banjo, that tailstock all the way out. Flute closed over to about 10, 1030. Again, we're hollowing end grain. So I'm going to start just behind center and below it at the five o'clock position with my flute pointed at about the 1030 position. As I advance the tip forward, the bevel pushes it to center. If I've got my rest a bit high, I'm gonna get too much vibration on here. And since I'm just a touch low, I need to lift the tool up just off the rest and I can plunge straight back in. I was getting just a little bit of burn on this tool, so I'm gonna slow down my RPM. Use my thumb as a depth gauge and eyeball that flute, or the tip of the tool. And I've hollowed that out, double check that. Now the tip of this tool is very hot. The best way to test this is not with your finger, but with your tongue. Your tongue heals quicker than your finger. Both of them will still burn, don't get me wrong there. It'll still burn you. Now one thing that I'm noticing right now is that my gut is hitting into my handle on my banjo. So I'm just gonna rotate that over, get it out of my way. And then I'm gonna reach over, bring my speed up from that 1,000 to 1,500 RPM that I drilled at back up to about my 2,500 RPM turning speed. Again, with the flute pointed at the 1030 between say nine o'clock and 1030 position. I can then come in, take small bites, and pull towards the outside. I'm taking about a quarter inch cut right there. I'm gonna leave a quarter inch wall right now for this. Come in, take a second cut. I'm either squeezing with my fingers and pulling the tool towards the outside, or I'm pushing a little bit with my right hand and pushing the handle away. Both cuts will yield the same results. Starting to get a nice little squill off the tool and that's the tool flexing from the reach on that rest. Gonna come in, I tried dampening that with my fingers first, still getting it, I'm gonna take smaller bites. The wider you go, the more squill you're gonna get. I can turn the tool over so it's a little less aggressive. That quiets it up. Bottom line is that noise is the tool letting you know you're abusing it. And it's about time to switch over to another tool. Now I'm down to my depth of my original drill hole or very close to the depth on my original drill hole. And I'm gonna come back in and clean and refine this curve up with my scraper. The scraper I'm going to use here is a French curve scraper with a negative rake ground into it. Tool rest height, standard will work good. Slightly higher is a little bit better and that way I can still have a trailing action to my tool just like I would with a traditional or a positive rake scraper. And that way I'm still working with the same techniques and I'm much less likely to have any kind of a catch. However, a negative rake 
is much less likely to have a catch than a positive rake scraper. As I look at this piece and I'm set up here, one thing that bothers me that I don't like is I don't like the fact that I've got a flat rim. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I bring this up to speed is I'm just going to come in and slope the rim in just a little bit. And you can also see out here how your tool's working on this surface. Now I've got my, my hand is over the, the well or the bulge in the handle up by the ferrule and then the handle is tucked under my forearm here. To me that's a big safety issue because if I should happen to have a catch here in order for the tool to come out of my hand and hit me in the head it has to take my arm off and go through my arm. So I would much rather have good secure hold on it here than be out here. Right there if it grabbed and popped then it's got nothing between it and my head other than some air. So I'm going to tuck that underneath there. And there's two things I learned in Little League and that number one was choke up on the bat. So I've got a lot more control on the tool when I'm choked up here than I do here. So if I want a nice smooth curve, I'm going to choke up on the tool. The second thing I learned was there's ice cream at the end of the game. And I can work back and forth with this negative rake and thin this out to whatever thickness I want. I'm going to go with about a quarter inch goblet. This doesn't need to be super thin. And then come and blend this curve on the bottom out nicely. Okay, so you notice I've got my left hand anchored to the rest here and my thumb is anchoring the tool and I'm pivoting off of my thumb and my index finger on my left hand is actually riding on the outside of the bowl to stabilize the bowl. Now, luckily, we're designed with a built-in thermostat on if we're pushing too hard. If that's generating heat, you'll get, or friction, you'll get heat. And it'll let you know that you shouldn't be pushing that hard. That's just barely gliding. My finger's just barely gliding on that surface. If, by chance, your thermostat's not working too good, and you start to smell bacon cooking, you better be in the kitchen or you're pushing way too hard on that finger. Now, you want to be careful as you come into the center. Right there, I bumped just a little bit past center and you heard it. Give me just a little rattle as it wants to pick up and come across and set me back down. So you want to be careful as you come into that center that you're aware of where the tip is. I've still got quite a bit of wood to get out of the center there. I'm going to look down in, I can still see some of my hole from uh, my original hole. And these negative rakes lose their edge fairly quickly, so I've grabbed a diamond card. I'm going to hone the top surface first, and then hone the bottom surface. That'll put any burr up on the top side. Or go back to your grinder and this tool is ground 35 degrees on both sides, top and bottom. OK, 
kind of adjusting my fill with my left hand here, see which side, which surface I want, which is gonna feel most comfortable. As I come right into that center, you can hear it kinda of wanna skip. It's trying to pick the tool up. If I was putting any pressure in on that at all and forcing that tool, it'd grab that and wanna flip it over and spin it. Also be mindful that you don't want to build a cone up in the dead center because it'll also give you the same effect as wanting to grab that tool and pick it up. Just a puff of smoke there as I pushed in. There's not a lot of speed in that center. on there and so as I push against that I'm taking a rather blunt instrument into that and friction burning it. I'm going to move my left hand grip over the top just to give me a little bit more secure hold as I get right in on the center. Touch that edge one more time. You only have seconds of life here on a scraper. It's not minutes of life, it's seconds. Now I'm trying to avoid dropping my head and looking inside because as soon as I drop my head and look inside, the handle goes down, the tip goes up, and then it's going to embed into the wood. Once it gets into the wood, the motion of the lathe and the wood are gonna to wanna to pick that tip back up to where, put that tip back where it should be, and the handle comes up, and then the handle and your head are occupying the same point in space. And that's never good. As I come in, on the bottom I can fill that little nub and I just come in and just drop the handle a little bit and arc up. I start just below the nub, come in, find the back of the, the bowl and then just arc up. And as soon as I pull sideways I'm going to put a new uh, divot in. And so I want to watch pulling sideways because I don't want to put a, another little nub down in the bottom. Now as I reach in here, taking my potter's hands, the best set of calipers I own, or the one I rely on the most, I've got some extra thickness right here. So I'm gonna bring, come in and hollow a little bit more in this side. You can hear as I started that cut, as I get up on that wall, it's a little tinny in the sound. And that is vibration and a little bit less support. So it took some meat out of there. Still got more to go. There's the center, bump just past center. Got a little chatter. Okay, not bad. I do have a little nub down in the bottom. Still working a little bit of meat out of the side of this. Mm. 
come in and fill for that center. And you hear that rim getting very tinny. I'm seeing a little bit of torn grain in there. So I'm going to go back to my grinder, sharpen this up one more time, get my best burr possible, and then come back and try and skim that surface and get rid of any torn grain. Before I go to the grinder, I'm going to put a little bit of lubricant in there. Whatever paste wax you happen to have handy, or if you're putting a water-based finish on, Use whatever finish, whatever is, make sure whatever you put in here is compatible with your finish. This will be compatible with what I'm going to put onto this piece. And so I'm going to rub in a little bit of paste wax. I'm going to give that a few minutes to set while I sharpen this tool. That'll swell the fibers up a little bit and help me cut through them much cleaner. I've been to the grinder. You should be able to see the burr on this tool. Now, I've used a 35 degree bevel angle on both top and the bottom. I sharpen my top first and then my bottom, which puts the burr on the top of the tool and should give me my best chance at cutting. Now, I used my, very, I used my coarse grit wheel, I used my 80 grit CBN, to raise as large a burr as possible. I need to get into this and get a, a good bite hold of it to get underneath that torn grain. If I just needed to skim, I may go to one of my finer grit CBN wheels. So let's get our tool rest set up. I didn't change my height. We're still at standard tool rest height. I'm going to bring my lathe up to speed. Haven't changed speed, just sharpened the tool. We put that wax in there to support that, help support that fiber. Come in at center. And pull back. Now with that wax on there, I'm seeing a different shaving. It's definitely got some body in there. A lot less dust. Okay, that cut clean. I've got a curve that I like. And let's sand the inside of this goblet. I take my sheets, I cut them into one-sixth sheets, and then I fold them in thirds again. I'm going to reduce my speed from the 2500 RPM down to about half to a third of that. So somewhere in the 1000 RPM range for sanding. I never sand at the, my cutting speed, I sand at half to a third of my cutting speed. Your number one enemy when you're sanding is heat and that breaks down the glues that hold on to the abrasive. And your abrasive is your number two enemy. It comes around and knocks the next bit of abrasive off. I'm taking a 50% jump in abrasives. So I started with 120, I went to 180, I'm going to 240. Now the advantage of folding that into thirds is it doesn't slip on itself. So as I come in to hollow on the inside of that bowl, that paper doesn't slip. I'm going to take a little bit more of a jump now. I'm going to a 400 grit paper. And I tend to 
would prefer to have my jump at 400 right now, then sharpen or sand to 320, and then jump to a 600. So at 400, I should be able to stop and not see any scratches, but 600 gives me just a little bit of assurance that I'm not going to see any scratching. You notice how I don't roll that edge around. I come out and then sand that edge separate. I want to keep that nice and crisp. I'm going to set my papers to the side. I'm going to add a little scratch free, which is my last step in my sanding and my first step in my finishing. bit of paper towel and just burnish that scratch free into that cup. Okay, that's the inside surface. Now as I fill in here, I've still got a little mass right in here, but I've got a good inside curve. And so before I bring the tailstock up, I'm going to try and shape this surface a little bit. And if I don't need the tailstock to counter the vibration, It'll allow me to check my thickness much easier. So light cuts, sharp tool, Stop and check. That's coming around nice. I'm back up to my 2500 RPMs. I'm going to remove a little of this extra wood here so that I can bring this curve around a little further. As I come back on here, come to pick up my cut, make sure I'm anchored to the rest, find my bevel, and I tickle that tool back and forth until I pick up a cut. Now my eyes are going from the tip of the tool to the horizon to see the shape and the tool work done. Bring that curve around. Lower my rest just a touch. That'll give me a little bit better access. Remove a little bit of waste out of the way. Cutting a fillet right here. Now, if I just brought this bowl 
around all the way through here. If I just brought that bowl all the way around into a thin stem, I'd have no strength. And it would be very easy to pop that, that right off of that little thin stem. So I'm gonna do a fillet here or a flat and then go into a cove Arm just bumped the potentiometer for a second, lowered my RPMs, brought my RPMs back up. There's my fillet. And before I continue on here, I'm going to get something, some tailstock support in here. I'm going to get my revolving center. Put it in my tail stock. I'm going to put the cone back on it. I think that'll fit a little bit better for what I'm doing. I'm going to take a little bit of paper towel. Fold up a nice little pillow. Gently bring this in. I don't want the tip to embed down in. I don't want a point in the bottom of that cup. And I don't want to knock it off of its center. So it feels like it stayed on center. I'm going to move a little bit of wood out of the way here. For that, I'm going to come in with my bowl gouge. This is my 3 8 bowl gouge. It takes a couple of heavy cuts. And a couple in my book is three. I know I'm messed up, but that's the way it is today. Come back with my spindle gouge and refine that cove going in. Now, as I come around with this tool, when I come around I want to watch this big wall of end grain. I don't want to contact that with my uh, wing, my open cutting edge. That'll lead to a definite catch. So I'm going to stop just shy of where the last cut ended so I don't pick up that wall of wood. Okay, that's still pretty heavy. It's about three-eighths of an inch. And I'm going to come back and sand this surface here. Because once I neck this down to the final surface, I don't want to put the tension on here that it'll take to sand. Reducing my speed from the 2500 to about 1000 RPMs. I'm going to come up underneath support my sandpaper with both hands get into that fillet so I get into that fillet with the corner of the paper and move through the grits. Now I've put red lines on each of my sheets. This one has four, so I know it's 400. The previous one had three. It was 240. One before that had two, it's 180. 
and then I started with one line at 120. Now when I get to 600, that's way too many lines for me to draw, and I've only got five fingers, so I can't count to six. So I put one squiggly line on the paper. Now that I've got this sanded out to 600, I'm going to prepare it for finish like I did the inside with my scratch free. Coat a little bit on, burnish it in with the lathe running. Take my thumbnail right into that fillet behind the paper towel so that it gets the finish the same, equal all the way down. Go to a clean part of the cloth. And I've got that cup done down to the fillet. Bringing my tool rest back around from my 1000 RPM back up to my 2500. I want to be careful on this start. I don't want to have that skid back up so that I make certain that I'm anchored to the rest and that my bevel makes contact first. before I sweep around in that cove. You decide how thin thin is. We're about three sixteenths of an inch right there. I'm going to come back to my bowl gouge again. Eighth inch to three sixteenths of an inch cut. Move wood out of the way. Little skate right there because I didn't get the tip into the, of the tool in the cut first. I came in and I let that lower wing make contact because I have my handle down. That'll be important to know when I get to the end of this. Right now it doesn't affect anything. It just kind of chews things up a little bit. I can afford to skate here, I can't afford to skate down here. Using the wing of the gouge, I'm now shear scraping down to the diameter. I'll turn the tool over, turn the tool over, and come back from the top of the cup or the top of the stem down. Check your diameter. Again, waste off a little bit more wood. Waste out a little bit more wood. Three or four cuts. Using the wing. Cut back.
I want to be careful as I come out on this area that I don't, I'm really careful with my cuts because I'm getting thin behind there. I'm now going to come in, again reduce my speed, down to about 1500 this time. I don't have a lot of diameter, so I don't need to reduce the speed as much. And that's cut fairly clean, so I'm going to start with 240 grit. Four hundred grit. Six hundred grit. A little scratch free. Just for safety sakes. And it's not my safety I'm worried about here, it's the stem safety. I'm going to take a very small bit of paper towel rather than a full sheet. And the safety I'm worried about is this somehow being able to grab it, roll it up, and if I've got a big bunch of paper towel there, that could snap the stem. Bring my tool rest back in. Now I realize I'm doing this with the lathe running. If you've got an older lathe with a capacitor start motor, that'll also be one without an electronic variable speed, those kick up from zero to whatever speed instantly. I don't want a, this lathe to come up to speed instantly and snap that, torque that cup right off. The resistance from your tailstock can sometimes do that, especially with the older machines. So I don't move this all, I don't drop all the way down to zero RPMs on here if I don't have to. And I try to do this in one shot. So if I need a break, if I feel I need a break coming on, I'll take it before I come down to this diameter. But I try and do this stem and finish this in one session if possible. Repeat, same cuts as before. I even repeated the catch right there. Get some wood out of the way. Then with the tip of the tool, then slide to the wing of the tool. Now if you don't want your stem to look like a wood dowel, throw a bead or a little decoration in it. You could also put a little taper to your stem, looks quite nice. Clean that edge up a bit. Okay, I'm getting closer to this end. I don't want to have a skate now, so I'm going to watch my starting cuts. And I'm also going to start practicing what I want for a base. 
or practicing my cuts for the base. For me, that's going to be a little bit of an OG curve. Cove and a bead. There is my skate, very small. Bring my stem back. That was the skate I definitely didn't want to have. But I've got the material, I think I can get up underneath it. Clean that surface up. I'll reach in and fill that. I don't want to shut the lathe off and look at it. I'm going to do a similar design down here on the base as what I've got up on against the cup as far as putting an OG curve onto the piece. Now my base is a little bit different, it's got more of an OG than the simple curve on there, but they both ends have the fillet on them. I don't know if you picked it up right there, but I had a little bit of trouble getting that tool to find an edge. It tells me I'm starting to lose my sharpest edge off of this tool and it's really time to go to the grinder. Because that tip is not as sharp as it should be. So I've switched over to my smaller spindle gouge.
started in a cut with my parting tool. Got my same series of sandpaper. 240. You see that little shiny spot right there. That's the lowest spot on there. I need to sand until it all looks the same. Has all the same surface texture to it. I'm going to drop back to 180. Got some tool marks on the cove in this base, and they're from the bevel of the tool, they're compression marks. Then go back to my 240. Four hundred. So I've got one compression mark right there. I could sand that out, take my skew, lay it flat on the rest, long point into the piece, and cut a little V-groove and make it look like I intended a decoration there. Now as I come in to part this off, I've already started a little bit of a groove where I want to start. Now I'm going to come in and take just about a 64th of an inch. Cut and I'm going straight across with that and then I'm going to angle in towards the stem. But I've got that little surface flat right now. And I've also kind of tapered this in a little bit this shoulder so that it doesn't anchor to the table. It's got a lift to the table. And you can see the angle on my parting tool is angled in. I cut a waist area out and then I come in and take a light skimming cut hoping that little clearance angle, but I'm hoping that as I come in with that light skimming cut that I get a cleaner surface than I would when I'm doing my heavier cut. So waste first. And then a light skimming cut. I'm going to take a little bit more waste out of this. Reducing down from my 2500 RPMs down to about 2000 RPMs. I'm down to about a quarter inch in diameter in that stem. My left hand has came up over the headstock and is rested on the headstock and I've got the stem held between two fingers and almost got away from myself. Need to finish this lower end. 
It'd be a lot easier to do that while it's under power. You get the scratch free on there than it will be after I've parted this off. Again, I don't want a big piece of paper here to get caught up. Now you could come in with a handsaw and gently separate that and there's nothing wrong with that. And probably a good move, especially if on your first ones. I'm just going to gently whittle away. And I want this cut to stop the headstock side of the piece. I want to leave a nub in the goblet. I'm more concerned about tearing fibers out of the goblet than I am about leaving a nub. I know I didn't have much tension on that tailstock. Never part off when you're between centers with tension like that. You even saw how that grabbed a little bit between the two nubs. My next step is I'm going to take my chuck off and then put in my drill chuck and put a sanding mandrel in my drill chuck to sand this off. So I'll set my goblet to the side for now. Clear my lathe. Tailstock out of the way. Banjo out of the way. Chuck out of the way. Blow the dust out of your Morse taper. Wipe the dust off the Morse taper. Put your Jacobs chuck in. I like the keyless Jacobs chucks. That way I don't have to worry about where I left my key last. I've got a sanding mandrel in my Jacobs chuck and a hundred piece of 180 grit abrasive. Only going to run with about 500 RPM here. Doesn't need a lot. I'm not going to just place this flat against the disc. I'm going to work on the edge and work at taking that nub off of there. And you can see that's slightly concaved in that surface. And I'm holding that off a little bit at an angle and roll that around. Uh, I, I prefer this method over going to a belt sander and trying to sand everything flat. That little quarter inch cut that I did going in and kept that flat gives me a good indication or an indicator of where I can sand to and to keep a flat surface. And then as I'm working this piece I just kind of keep rolling it in my fingers as I get finer in my sanding I can let that kind of spin sometimes freely by itself. It'll use its own inertia to spin them. And 
can see a little bit of that inertia there and just put a little resistance by pinching it. From there, I would move through the grits, but you've seen one grit, you've seen them all. Finish the bottom to the same standard that you did the top. And then wax that surface and it's all ready for you to sign, date, and put the species on. All right, here's the two goblets that we worked with. One, this was the one that we started. I showed you at the first. This was the one that we did today. This one's got an OG curve in the bowl, a little bit taller um, line on it or a tulip curve, and then a tapered stem. And we talked about both those design changes. This one has the, just a classic open bowl shape to it, a thin stem, a bead in there, in the center of the stem, and down to the foot. So there's many design changes that you could do here and all, uh, ways to test out and practice with. Length, diameter. I remember years ago, I made a small goblet out of a pen blank, put a triple ribbon twist down through it. So this was five inches tall, three quarters of an inch in diameter, African blackwood, and I took it and I gave it to my wife and I told her happy birthday and she looked at it and said, you usually do better than this. And I said, well, gee, thanks. I thought I did pretty good with this. And she said, no, you usually give me money. So guess what my wife gets for her birthday every year now? So try a few different design changes here. You don't have to be too particular about the wood. I want a good close grain hardwood, but it doesn't have to be real expensive stuff. It doesn't have to be walnut. It could be your maples, whatever you've got handy in your shop. Give it a go, try a few designs, have some fun here. We'll see you later.